Anyway, I'm just going to start playing stuff. <laughs> this doesn't have to be recorded. This is just. Fun. Quatermass. 
back in the early 70s, and then it was redone by Blackmore's Rainbow. Crack open. 
demons in the gates of hell. Let more poison and sickness expel in blue to misery.
introduce uh, Joe first. So this is Christian. Oh, okay. I'm going to start off with a song. So how are we going to start now? You can inter maybe just introduce the song. It's the green one, not green part. Old green this year. Okay. Hello, <laughs> everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Um, welcome, everybody, to the uh, uh, Green Party National Day of Action on Climate Change. Uh, this, we're having a number of events uh, around this uh, uh, National Day of Action in various cities. Uh, and this is the event in Manhattan. We have a number of our uh, Green Party local, state, legislative, and congressional candidates here today, and we have Paul Lundgren on the guitar, <laughs> and uh, with his song. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, I guess uh, you want to lead off? All right, why not? Okay, this is uh, it's interesting. This is my uh, Voting Green this year's song. Um, it's interesting, I wrote this at another climate change event back in 2005. We did a global warming event at um, Madison Square Park. And Julia Willibrand will be here later. She's our candidate for the uh, 46, uh, 67th Assembly District. She asked if I could write a Green Party song, so uh, I did. And this is it. It's called Voting Green this year. I'm voting green this year for my hopes and not my fears. You know there's got to be a better way. introduce our first speaker, which is uh, Professor Joe Diaferia. Uh, he is a, uh, teaches political science at Raritan uh, State College of New Jersey, and he is our congressional candidate in the 16th Congressional District in 
Westchester and the Bronx. Thank you, John. Good afternoon, everyone. I am running in the 16th Congressional District, which encompasses the Northern Bronx and Lower Westchester, and I would like to speak briefly as an educator. There is a, um, a recurring notion, or such has been my experience whenever the, whenever the question of global warming and climate change is addressed, that global warming, supposedly, I mean, to, the, to those who would suggest that the whole idea is a fraud, supposedly it is part of a global cyclical phenomenon and that, that, that climate changes have occurred every couple of centuries or so. Now, first of all, I believe that there it is really a fallacy to presume that there is a dichotomy between this natural cyclical phenomenon on the one hand and anthropogenic global warming on the other. Those who would suggest and I do believe fraudulently that there is no such thing as global warming and that it's merely a fraud and that it's all part of this cyclical phenomenon. They offer no solutions as to how we should be prepared for or how, what we should be doing to get, us, get ourselves ready for these cataclysmic events, perhaps. So by not addressing that, they really belie their own thesis that anthropogenic global warming doesn't exist, because we do know it does. And those who would suggest also that carbon emissions do not contribute in any way, shape, or form to climate change, and I've heard that suggested also. They also don't take into account that methane emissions are equally deleterious to our environment and are responsible for many of the same climate changes. So the idea that global warming is a fraud is in itself a fraud because again what we what we likely have are the shills from corporate America claiming that there is no such thing as climate change that um, that there is no such thing as anthropogenic damage to our environment and it, and it goes to the same policy on the port on the part of corporate America let's let's protect profits by denying that the profit system is doing anything to the environment. So what we have is a system. The capitalist system, let's be frank, the capitalist system is in its final throes. It is, a, it is not a sustainable paradigm. It is a reductio ad absurdum. So what are we doing? We are fighting wars overseas in pursuit of resources that are neither sustainable nor ecologically sound, and we are doing so to perpetuate a system that is neither sustainable nor humane nor ecologically sound. So to those who would deny the existence of global warming who would, or who would deny the reality of anthropogenic global warming, it is time, you, it is time to call you out. You are a fraud. Okay, I thank you. Thank you, Joe Diaferia. Uh, so I should mention that part of the action, uh, climate action plan of the uh, uh, Green Party is to set aside a fund of $300 billion to allow uh, us to phase out fossil fuels and nukes by 2025. And that money could come from a tax on windfall profits in fossil fuel companies, cuts to the military budget, and fees on carbon emissions. And, and ending subsidies on fossil fuels and nukes. Uh, okay, our next candidate speaker will be Tom Syracuse, our, uh, the chair of the uh, uh, Manhattan Greens and a candidate for state senate in the, 20, in the 29th Senate District, is that right, Tom? In, uh, in, in uh, the west side of Manhattan and, and, the, and the South Bronx. My, my colleague, Joe Diaferia, mentioned capitalism. And I think that unless we focus on <clears throat> that system, 
then we are always going to be falling into all kinds of confused thinking and wrong decisions. This whole thing that uh, you better not vote for a, uh, an independent third party uh, if you're a progressive like the Greens because that would mean siphoning off votes for the lesser of the two evils, namely uh, Obama. And unless you have a, an understanding of how powerful and, and the effect of capitalism has on our political, economic, and social system, you're going to make this mistake of considering Obama as the lesser of two evils, and God forbid that Romney should get elected because then civilization as we know it will come to a halt. That did, uh, when Obama, I mean, when Romney was governor of Massachusetts, uh, much of what he did there was what Obama uh, is, uh, has done as president, including this horrible health care plan, which is a boon to the health care industry. And that's another thing about the Green Party. We not only uh, we focus in on the environmental issue, but on all these issues, the health issue, the uh, economic issues, because we are in a crisis. It's not only an environmental crisis, an economic crisis. It, it is a total worldwide social crisis. And this is what uh, many Greens, I hope that more and more like the majority will, will focus on, that this crisis comes from a greedy, blind system of, that puts profit and power ahead of everything else. And this system is incapable of solving the, all of these crises, environmental, economic, social, in fact, it's not only incapable, it is the reason we have these crises. I mean, this whole idea of, well, maybe we should go back to the good old days when America was uh, more democratic or when capitalism was more benign. This is utter, um, well, uh, it's, it's an utter illusion. This country, from its founding, was never benign or democratic. <laughs> in fact, the word democracy never appears in the Declaration of Independence or in our Constitution. And many of our founding fa fathers, such as Madison, uh, were, uh, came out strongly against the whole idea of democracy. He called the, the people a mob. And <clears throat> so, to, and as far as our economic system goes, the only reason that capitalism did not bring about the, the kind of worldwide crisis that we're in today is because in those days, it wasn't as strong as it is today. And so that's what we have to focus in on. We cannot fall into this absurdity of voting for Obama because he's the lesser of the two evils. The fact of the matter is, both Obama and Romney have the same boss. And that boss is just downtown here on Wall Street. And whoever gets, they may sound different, especially during this election, but whoever gets elected, they will have to do the bidding of that boss. So one will go a little bit to the, uh, uh, to the center, and the other one will go a little bit to the center, and you'll get the same stuff over and over again. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Tom, Syracuse. Uh, and uh, it's good that we make these connections between the uh, uh, ecological crisis and uh, the general economic and social crisis worldwide. Uh, solving the ecological crisis is probably one of the best ways to uh, bring about investment in a more humane society uh, and healing the, the rift between, uh, of inequality worldwide. Uh, my next speaker will be Carl Lundgren, who is, uh, uh, I forget all his titles, one of his titles is Chair of the Bronx County Green Party.
Yeah, and uh, he's also running for uh, running for office in the 34th Senate District in the Bronx and Westchester. Well, London. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for all coming to this event. Um, I didn't have any uh, anything prepared for this particularly. I was just uh, thinking of things on the way down on the subway, uh, thinking of things that I've read over the years, and. Uh, <coughs> One of the things that I, I've come across many times in, in readings from the time I was in high school, this was back in the 70s, was that uh, climate change is going to happen if we don't start doing things about it. Um, there was a book I read from the 1940s that uh, talked about uh, climate change, um, you know, with the, with the way we were doing things even back at that time. So this is nothing new. This is uh, nothing that uh, hasn't been predicted by scientists. Unfortunately, it's something that uh, the public doesn't really understand. And that got me thinking about something called uh, biophilia. This is a concept that was uh, uh, proposed by uh, Edward O. Wilson and a uh, Dr. Stephen J. Kellett from Yale University. It's the concept that um, we are part of the natural environment and we have an affinity for it, whether we realize it or not. It's one of the reasons we want to keep pets. It's one of the reasons that we like to have uh, plants in the, in the house. We have this connection with the natural environment. And yet, uh, we have become so disconnected from it over the um, past few decades, and maybe past couple of centuries, that we don't realize this infinity anymore. We don't recognize it. Uh, part and parcel with that, too, is the idea of fearing things. We don't have fears of a lot of these things that are getting ready to kill us. Uh, thousands of years ago, millennia ago, we understood that da uh, snakes were dangerous, that um, spiders were dangerous, that falling off a cliff was dangerous, that fire could hurt you. But we don't have the same fears when it comes to nuclear energy, when it comes to driving quickly, when it comes to fracking processes, or, or any of these things. There is no visceral connection. We haven't um, developed it within our uh, DNA yet. So we, don't under, we understand it on an intellectual level, but we don't understand it on that real visceral level. So we can talk to we're blue in the face about shutting down Indian Point or banning fracking, um, about stopping the gas line in Puerto Rico. And we can all understand, yes, yes, it's got to be done. Yeah, it's, oh, it's too bad they're doing that. But until we feel it in our gut, um, this is going to be a, a very slow process. Uh, one of the things that I think the Green Party uh, should be doing and is doing, uh, we are a different dynamic than the Republicans and the Democrats. We are an activist party. Petra Kelly, who started the party in Germany back in the uh, late 70s, called it the anti-party party. The whole idea was that we were not going to do the same things as the other parties. We were going to be the antagonists to those parties. We weren't going to uh, do business as usual. And we were going to be out in the streets with the people, demonstrating against um, against war, against uh, nuclear energy, um, against all these things that are killing us. And to some extent, that has happened with a number of Green parties around the world. Uh, the United States, I think, has to come up um, to speed on that with um, other countries. I think we need a stronger Green movement. And I think with getting ballot status that we got recently, um, and having all these candidates running that you see here today, we have a good chance of starting up a real Green movement. and. Um, getting people more involved. We have to do this on a community level, and that's what we're going to be working on in the years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carl Lundgren, our candidate for state senate in the 34th Senate District. Uh, speaking of the international connections, uh, I did want to point out that uh, the Green Party does stand for an international treaty on climate change, according to the UN. Framework. Uh, I guess it's the Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, anyway, our next speaker uh, will be uh, Pat Dwyer. Uh, Pat is our candidate for uh, assembly in the uh, 46th Assembly District in Brooklyn. Well, where are we? Um, for a long time, 
Green Party has been fighting for the environment. But I haven't seen the kind of changes that we need to see. I haven't seen the kind of uh, response to global warming that we really need. And I'm very, very concerned. So we need to redouble our efforts. I, I personally think that we need uh, a faster pace than what the Green Party itself has even set for uh, getting to 100%. I think we have to do whatever we can to kick it into uh, existence so that we're moving forward even faster. Um, I think that's all I really have to say. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Okay, thanks guys. here, uh, Stan Zuger, who is running for the assembly in the 85th assembly district in the Bronx. Uh, Stan Zuger. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, it's nice to be here today. It's a surprise. I didn't know what this meeting was. I just learned about it on the spur of the moment. So uh, I wrote down uh, a, so a small statement for my campaign. Uh, for the 85th Assembly District of New York State, which is going to, uh, the election will be this fall. But uh, this uh, is just a proposal. Since uh, the left uh, has always been criticized, with, criticized for just criticizing and never proposing any alternatives to these, all these problems that we have, I thought I would try to present an alternative, which may be more like, uh, may not be taken very seriously, but uh, I'm just going to present it and uh, let the, uh, let the dust blow where it does. This is a, a call to all inventors. And it, we're trying to address the problem of, uh, of fracking, which is a way of ex extracting methane gas from uh, shale rock deposits. And uh, in the process, uh, uh, high pr highly forcing, forcing pressure, water under high pressure into the bro broken rock shale formations to, to uh, force out the natural gas, which is, is chemically, it's methane gas. So this would cause a tremendous amount of pollution, uh, would cause a tremendous amount of uh, release of all kinds of dangerous chemicals into the water that's used to, to release the natural gas, including radon gas, which is uh, naturally stored underground. So this is my proposal as an alternative to fracking and uh, what as a way of getting the methane gas, which is, as we all know, is, is used for cooking and uh, other things, even though car engines, automobile engines. This is really a, I'm really addressing inventors and scientists more than just uh, us uh, and the voters, but everybody should be, uh, take cognizance of it. The, uh, my proposal uh, is, would uh, if I was elected, in the 85th Assembly District of New York State, I would introduce a bill which would first call for a feasibility study of how to capture natural gas without fracking. And uh, I offer the following alternatives for capturing natural gas, which is called methane gas. I think it's a CH3, the chemical uh, uh, way of writing it, on, writing it down. Human beings, and that's all of us, Okay, if we eat all kinds of food as a part of a digestive process, we give off uh, as a byproduct, uh, as a waste product, uh, solid waste, liquid waste, and the natural gas. I can't believe there is a, uh, isn't a scientist or an inventor around who cannot invent a method of capturing natural gas from every human being. At the same time, why can't we do the same for farm animals, which farm animals have been blamed for a uh, producing the global warming uh, greenhouse effect because of the natural gas that they emit, they emit into the environment. Why can't that natural gas, gas be captured? The third, of course, would include pets, domesticated animals. The fourth would be uh, something like 
the use of um, sugar cane to make, na uh, to make uh, ethanol for uh, automobile ga uh, fuel, automobile uh, gasoline. This would uh, be uh, growing beans in factory farms and then harvesting the beans and then setting up tanks, one minute will be, setting up tanks to, to uh, ferment these beans and produce the methane gas. So th those are some of my uh, thoughts on this uh, beginning of my campaign for the fall, 85th Assembly District of New York State. And I would like to rest my case at that, on that, in those words. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks, Dan Zucker. Uh, I guess uh, uh, Dan pointed out indirectly uh, that uh, Greens are, you know, not, not only against fracking because of the pollution to the water, soil, and food, but uh, we're generally against all greenhouse gases and uh, and fracking, of course, is just another source of greenhouse gas, especially methane. There's even more greenhouse gas uh, that uh, more uh, dangerous greenhouse, more polluting greenhouse gas than uh, than uh, carbon. Uh, uh, anyway, um, our next uh, candidate speaker is Jeff Perez. He's the assembly candidate from the 13th Assembly District in Nassau, all in Nassau now, right? Okay, Jeff. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to hear you repeat after me. Give me a G. Give me an R. Give me an E. E. Give me an E. e. Give me an N. A. What's that spell? Green. What's that spell? Green. What's that spell? Green. Thank you. I'm Jeff Perez, and I'm running for the 13th Assembly District in Nassau County, Long Island, against a current Assemblyman Chuck Levine. Uh, my opponent, the other Republican candidate I'm challenging also, their party has a different view on hydraulic fracturing. Republicans, they believe in drill, baby, drill. And my Democratic opponent, he says, oh, well, what should we do about the shale uh, drilling? He's, he's not for it. That party, the Democratic Party, is in favor of a moratorium, which is pretty much put it off till election time. The Green Party, what do we stand for? No hydraulic fracturing. I want to give you a little information about what's happened in Pennsylvania with the hydraulic fracturing. The gas companies leased out to the, um, they leased out to landowners to drill on their land. What they failed to mention was, upon drilling, the gas ended up going into their drinking wells, and they could no longer drink their water from their wells because of that. I also want to point out another thing about hydraulic fracturing. It did not create jobs like they said in Pennsylvania because they hired outsiders. And what happened was these outsiders came around and they didn't help. It did not help the local economy. They drilled, it took all these cranes, it caused a traffic nightmare in those areas because most of those areas in rural Pennsylvania were one lane traffic per side. The third thing I want to point out is the waste. Where are they disposing this waste? There's no place to dispose the waste. And many municipalities do not want to waste, dispose this waste. We have a solution, or I have a solution that would create jobs in New York State instead of hydraulic fracturing. That would be hemp, for one thing. You grow hemp, you legalize industrial, industrial hemp, which would give the farmers upstate and statewide enough money to generate. And they would sell to the fuel industry which would create, which would be good for home fueling, home heating, and even car fuel. The other thing we could do is we have solar, solar electric, and we have hy uh, hydroelectric and wind power. All those combined would create jobs because it would create industry for, for those type of jobs to install and to educate people. We're not only just for the environment, we are also for the um, Social and economic justice. I want, we want to forgive debt on the statewide level. I want to tell you about it. New York State has 
a stock transfer tax, which is one-tenth of a percent. But we do not see that money because every single year we rebate the Wall Street, Wall Street and the banks. That's a generation of revenue of $154 billion. Now do the math. We're in a $7.9 billion debt. If we took that back, $154 billion, we're in a $146 billion surplus. Anyway, please vote for Jeff Perez at w and look at my website, www. Press for assembly, P E R E S S dot info. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you, Jeff Perez. Uh, uh, our featured speaker, our featured speaker today is uh, Chris Williams. Uh, he is a longtime environmental activist. Uh, he's the author of the 2010 book Ecology and Socialism. Uh, adjunct professor of chemistry and physical science at Pace University, and uh, publications have appeared in a number. Of, his writings have appeared in a number of publications, C Magazine, Coast uh, and uh, Independent, and others. Uh, he remains active in the uh, Occupy Wall Street Environmental Solidarity Working Group, and uh, Chris Woods. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks for inviting me to uh, come and speak. Um, actually, the first scientific paper about global warming came out in 1879. So the, we've had a long time to think about this. And where we've got to in the 21st century seems to be either we deny that it's happening or uh, we blame over-flatulent cows for the problem, which conveniently lets off the hook uh, the people who have managed to burn one trillion barrels of oil since 1950, and today we burn uh, 80 million barrels of oil every single day. 20 million barrels coming from this country alone. So it's not surprising, I think, that both major parties don't really have any kind of coherent policy when it comes to eradicating and moving away from oil. In fact, quite the opposite. Uh, the United States at the moment, having spent 40 years, particularly since 1970, worried about where the extra oil that we import was going to come from, uh, and invading various different countries over the last 10 to 15 years to make sure that we keep getting it, is now awash in oil and gas. The oil companies, the gas companies, are absolutely ecstatic at the new technologies which are allowing for increased implementation and increased extraction of oil and gas, because apart from the fracking, uh, for gas, you can also frack for oil, which they're now doing in Texas and around, around the rest of the country. And so actually, uh, the new prediction is that the U.S. could be self-sufficient in oil by 2035. So the idea that we're running out or there's going to be peak oil or whatever is not going to save us and is actually fallacious because they've just invented new technologies, talking about new technologies and the inventiveness of American capitalism or world capitalism uh, to solve its problems. They're already on their way to doing so, and it's pretty clear that neither major party has any kind of answer to uh, the problem. I, let me quote from one of them. I believe that climate change is occurring. The reduction in size of the global ice caps is hard to ignore. I also believe that human activity is a contributing factor. Uh, that was uh, Mitt Romney in, in his book, No Apology, in 2009. Um, it's also, uh, when he was governor, uh, he was sharply critical of the heavily polluting uh, coal plant in Salem, Massachusetts, which Obama is now running attack ads in, in Ohio saying that uh, Romney is anti-coal. Uh, so uh, Obama in his uh, DNC speech uh, recently said, my energy plan will continue to reduce the carbon pollution that is heating our planet because climate change is not a hoax. More droughts and floods and wildfires are not a joke. They are a threat to our children's future. Well, that sounds pretty good, especially as this year has been dominated by the news in this country and around the world of uh, an unprecedented drought coming hard on the heels of last year when most of the Midwest was underwater. Uh, and this year, of course, we've had the lowest extent of Arctic ice ever. Uh, and so it's pretty hard to ignore. But then on the other hand, he goes on to say uh, earlier this year, in, uh, April, on April 17th, 
President Obama, there are politicians who say that if we just drilled more, then gas prices would come down right away. What they don't say is that we have been drilling more. Under my administration, America is producing more oil than at any time in the last eight years. We've opened up new areas for exploration. We quadrupled the number of operating rigs to a record high. We've added enough new oil and gas pipeline to circle the earth, and then some. Uh, and so the contradictory politics of both politicians, basically they'll say anything to get elected at this point, and the world will continue to burn. So it's pretty obvious that whoever you vote for, we end up getting played. And when, when, when you transfer that kind of national politics to what's going on in New York State, you, cite, you find the same situation. Because we are facing the question of, do they build new transmission lines from Canada to uh, allow for extra production of electricity here? Or do we retrofit the old coal plants and allow them to continue to operate for another 50 years? That's kind of the debate that's going on in Albany at the moment. I think we have to say that neither of those options is really what we need if we're going to move forward to a new energy paradigm. Because when you, there's a recent study that came out that showed that there is more than ample uh, wind energy alone to provide for all of the electric, tr electricity needs of the entire planet. So this is not a question of uh, technology. It's purely, as the scientists who carried out that study said, purely a question of politics and economics. Uh, and yet Obama has just uh, vetoed the building of wind turbines in Oregon because they are apparently a danger to national security, citing a 1950 law, Cold, era law, uh, Cold War era law, uh, because those wind turbines will be built by China. So, um, so we can't have those wind turbines because they're Chinese made and that will be a threat to national security. But apparently, uh, building more and more oil pipelines is nothing to do with national security, it's totally fine. So it's pretty clear that we need an alternative both uh, in this city and this state and in the country. And neither of those things are going to happen by voting for either of the main, uh, mainstream parties. Let me quote from a, uh, another president uh, very briefly. The question of our age is, shall we sur surrender to our surroundings or shall we make peace with nature and begin to make reparations for the damage we have done to our air, to our land and to our water? Restoring nature to its natural state is a cause beyond party and beyond factions. It has become a common cause of all the people of this country. It is a cause of particular concern to young Americans because they more than, more than we will reap the gr grim consequences of, of our failure to act on programs which are now needed uh, if we are to prevent disaster later. Um, he goes on, this requires comprehensive new regulations. It also requires that to the extent possible the price of goods should be made to include the cost of producing and disposing of them without damage to the environment. So uh, that was uh, President Richard Nixon in uh, 1970 State of the Union address when he devoted a large percentage of that address to uh, restoring the environment and protecting it for future generations. And so what made that egomaniac uh, who'd caused colossal environmental damage, not to mention mass murder all around the world, particularly in Southeast Asia, decide to devote such a major percentage of his speech to environmental questions, and not only that, not rhetorically, but actually implement them too. So the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency was his policy. For example, the Clean Water Act, which turns 40, his policy. Uh, the Clean Air Act also, uh, we can only explain that not by people voting Democrat or obviously voting Republican, but being out on the streets as part of a mass movement. And so that's really the lesson that we have to learn because there are 1,459 days between each four-year election jamboree. And as, and as important as we want to stay uh, and get involved in de the democratic process to the extent that we're even allowed to, seeing as they exclude the Democratic, uh, the Green Party from those debates, uh, there are 1,459 days between those things. And those days determine what goes on on the 1,460th day, more than anything else. And so that is really the, what we need to do right now and in looking into the future. Uh, it's not just a question of whether you vote or don't vote and who you vote for necessarily on election day, though there is obviously a place, an important place for that. It's also about... What are we going to do with regards to building a movement all across the country that can implement the solutions that we, we know will, will work, right? Because uh, 
Over and above everything else, what we need to do is build a new transmission line uh, for electricity because the current system, which we know doesn't really work even on its own uh, grounds because there are blackouts and brownouts all over the place all the time, uh, that transmission system is built around large uh, individual plants based on coal, nuclear, and gas. Alternative wind, solar, etc. doesn't work like that which is something that the German government has been forced to implement by a mass movement there. So they're spending billions of dollars upgrading and completely changing their energy grid to take into account a totally different distributive electricity system based on wind and solar. If they can do it there, the fourth largest economy in the world, uh, what is preventing the largest economy, the richest country in the world, from doing the same? Uh, it's about redirecting. I mean, the Green Party says 300 billion uh, over the next 10 years or so for um, implementing this kind of change. Well, you know, that sounds like a lot of money, but the Pentagon gets 700 billion every single year. So there's more than a, enough money uh, washing around in the Pentagon and to those guys down on Wall Street that we can reappropriate towards uh, actual progressive goals that would serve the interests of all the people instead of such a tiny percentage. Because this really is about challenging the entire system and saying this system isn't going to work anymore and we need to develop an entirely new paradigm based on real democracy, social equity, justice and the absolutely inextricable, inextricable connection between social justice issues and ecological justice issues because we're not going to get one without the other. Thanks very much. I should mention that uh, uh, Chris Williams' book, Ecology and Socialism, is on sale here. Uh, it's an excellent book. Uh, a number of us have had a reading group, reading groups around it, and I recommend it for everybody. So pick up your copy. Oh. Yes? Uh, can I just make it that? If people are interested, uh, I'll give you an uh, evening course starting on Thursday at the right. on Thursday evening, so uh, starting at 6.30 for an hour and a half break week. So Yes, indeed. Um, okay, uh, I now have the uh, honor and uh, privilege to introduce uh, a lifelong fighter for uh, human rights, civil rights, and uh, freedom for all people, uh, our candidate for U.S. Senate in the state of New York, Collier Clark. Up, you know, in these environmental families that came out of Africa, and of course, indigenous families of the United States. But it was Africa that moved me because it was Africa that always sang songs to the wind, to the rain, and to storms, whether it was to the great Shango and Steal Away Home, or uh, to Oya, the great wind goddess. And there was one to Oya that really struck me as a child. I didn't understand it until about 10 years ago when I really recognized the war on the environment that I thought my father and mother were, were, were crazy when I was a child and they were talking about, you know, everything from charcoal for water to not breaking a limb off of a tree unless you were prepared to plant five more. But oh, y'all would do her thing. And she would say, oh, the wind, oh, the wind don't let her blow. Oh, the wind, my God's going to hold the wind. Oh, the wind won't let her blow. Now that we're in this crisis and the potential for losing the sun, which keeps the planet in place, the potential for losing the great wind, howling winds that move about us, sometimes quiet winds, we are in an age of species lethal, the weapons of species lethal. In an age when we are challenging the very planet on which we live and all of the resources, the natural resources, because those are the only resources ultimately that keep it in place. So in an hour like this, we need to 
stop and hold our breath for long enough to begin to appreciate the planet itself. A planet that has not opened its bowels for billions of years so that life might have a chance. And we challenge that very foundation of the mother planet. We can dream about Mars and the moon. We can dream about Venus and other places. We can dream about fresh water flowing in rivers somewhere. But ultimately, this is the bird in the hand. And I'm not talking about the hands of Gillibrand who kills birds. And I said that with all seriousness. We have a senator who kills birds. I come back to that. We are talking about the planet. The planet which provides us with life. It's not always easy. My father would always say, Mother Nature is not always kind. So we would have bad seasons. I grew up on a farm. You about figured that out by now for the first 15 years of my life in and off the farm. But I always appreciated the fact that if we work with nature and not against nature, if we work with the water, so if you go down there where my great-grandfather and grandfather had all of this raggedy land in Mississippi, the one thing you will notice is there's not one erosion line because you don't work against Mother Nature. Water seeks its course and you make sure that it takes its course. These are just the simplistic things, right? The things we found so simple then are so complex and complicated now. As I make a path for the United States Senate, I am not just running to get an office. I am running to build a platform for the 21st century, a freedom agenda with an economic bill of rights. An agenda that says, in the terms of energy, we got plenty of it. All we need is the common sense to be able, one, to revisit high school curriculum and say that we want to do what? We want to make sure that every child that leaves the 12th grade leaves with the skills, the tools, the knowledge to be able to feed, clothe, and house themselves. That means returning agriculture back to the curriculum. Not just because it provides food, but because it provides all the things that we need in this life. I call agriculture the science of life. Because everything that we need is housed there. We never had needs when we were in the woods in Mississippi. We were the mothers of recycling. We struggled for water all the time, but we always figured out a way. I remember my dad had a little old stick with some points on the end. And he'd be walking around with his stick. You know that doing thing works sometimes. But not always. But we struggled at ways of not only finding water, but making sure that it was brought up appropriately, not just anyway. You didn't dig a hole anywhere for water. You didn't plant a toilet on the hill because what? It endangered and your water that ran at the bottom of the hill, so you knew where to put the toilet. Just simple things of life. Back to agriculture. Back to talking about making sure that every high school in New York City is partnered with the community and families partnered with small businesses, as partnered, partnered with the farm community outside of the city, and that we need to buy that land and begin to work with farmers. I'm talking about small farmers now. I'm not talking about Monsanto farmers. I'm not talking about farmers that are dealing in fracking. We're not talking about those farmers. Because if you look at the farm bill, you will note one thing, 100 billion, 100 billion across the next 20 years, but who will the money go to? It's not going to the small farmer. It's not going to the small family farmer, or for that matter, to the middle family farmer. It's going to big farmers and corporate farmers. Who are going to do what? Work against the planet. We're talking about working against the planet, working against life itself. That's where it's going to go. So fracking will go forward. So when we go back and begin to look at high schools, if we begin then to set up an appropriate curriculum, a curriculum of human living that includes agriculture, we will be able to ask our youth to build roads, 
and bridges and create the jobs for mass roads and bridges so a mass population of workers going into the workforce, being able to do what? Mass transit, the ecosystem, the full ecosystem so that our young people are developing the tools and this next generation of workers are developing the tools that we need, but also they are out there developing solar power, wind power. Yes, they're using water power. This is what real curriculum for the 21st century has to look like. It's not a question anymore of what it must look like. We have been made buckethead consumers since the 50s, so that even as far away as Mississippi, in the backwoods where we were, I grew up with people saying, well, you can't wear them mammy-made suits and those mammy-made hairdos and those mammy-made this and mammy-made that. Assault on mama began with human mama and moved from her to Mother Earth. Because they were doing what? Moving us towards Sears Roebuck and J.C. Penney's and, and from there to the barbershops and all of these madnesses that we put in our head and on our face. That is the direction we came. Now we must go back and reclaim the planet by making sure that we have a curriculum in place. And I'm willing to work with every state legislator, every assemblyman, every city council person, and our mayor, that is the new mayor of New York, I'm assuming that we're going to get rid of the present mayor, move him on, and that he will be asked to turn over at least 50% of the 20 billion that he made in the last 10 years. We want it back in the budget. So what I'm talking about then is moving toward a new way of looking at how we rebuild. And it's nothing new. Economic Bill of Rights is nothing new. So when I talk about a freedom agenda on these issues, it is not new. President Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1944, 1944, I'm coming off, in 1944, sent to the United States Congress, and of course he was dead within less than a year, an economic bill of rights that called for constitutional right to education, a universal right to an education, a universal right to health care, and employment. Implied in that, I think, is always the notion that we must preserve, protect, control Mother Earth. So Gillibrand, the assassin, I want to let you know, you killed 751 geese. You said they were interfering with, 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 with transportation. That was a lie. Geese have a right to fly given them by Mother Nature. You also signed into law on June the 23rd, along with Senator Schumer, against the will of the people of New York and the will of the people of the United States of America, a bill around food that said we had no right to label genetic modified organisms. And now you're going after Intergy. I'm going after you. We need to ask her to come home quickly so we can re-educate this sister, because she's a fine young woman just need to come home, get educated, because I'm going to the Congress to take care of the real business. Thank you, New York. That we have a universal declaration of human rights. And among the many rights extended under that universal declaration of human rights, 1948, is the right of women. Women have rights. We will demand those rights that that Legislation is brought to the United States Congress that it is ratified, and not like we ratified the Human Rights Bill, where we said, with what was exception, but if we don't like it, we can take it back. We will ratify it in the Senate, ratify it in the Congress, and we will have America become a part of the human era, a part of the, of, of the, of the international community. And finally, I stand firmly on the right that my womb is my own, that my daughter's wombs are their own. What they do with them is their right. These are our bodies. So the right to own ourselves, to own our wombs, to own the children that come from our womb, and to raise them healthily in a healthier environment, and the right for those who need it and abortion of the morning and afternoon. Will you please send word to all those congressional candidates that didn't have mothers? And we're very confused. Like that. Yes, if you get raised, you can get pregnant and you can have a baby. 
women's rights, now and for better. Mama time. All right. Corporations are not involved in the electoral politics, are really in the politics of destroying the minds of the American people. The second thing is that no party, and Green Party certainly stands on it, needs millions of bucks to run a campaign. That's if we're running a campaign. Now, if we're running a game, I mean, that's kind of costly business. And scam artists who are in those games are use us, to abuse us, the lobbyists for the various corporations uh, will continue to do that for as long as we also live. But as for the question of entity and Monsanto, for whom it appears my, my uh, the candidate that I'm running against uh, is heavily involved, uh, Monsanto is a question of food issues. So if you're talk, talking about not labeling food, why would my candidate, our, can, our, well, our senator, Christian Gillibrand, take money and I'm assuming she took some money. I can't say she took some money, but all appearance, she must be taking money if 92% of the people of New York say they don't want you to do a thing and you're there to represent them. And all of a sudden, you vote absolute opposite direction. Something happened. And that's not just for the brand, that's also for Senator Schumer. And on the question of entity, something's, you know, it's all right. First of all, it's our plate. We don't, you got your plate, you got your baby formula, you don't want nothing hollering in your baby formula. Ah! You think it's the baby crying is what's in the bottle? Neither do you want to, on the question of energy, be faced with 
a nuclear disaster that is caused right, posed right now by Indian Point. And if we continue to allow our senators to play around with those who are now talking about four nuclear power plants like Indian Point, mostly in the South, I think that's Georgia and South Carolina, for numerous. We cannot afford to play games in the name of money. Senator Gillibrand had to learn. She's a young woman. She didn't know that when you died, there will be no U-Haul behind your hearse. So there's no need for you to collect money. Not really. So we in New York must be able to say to the citizens of New York, wake up, consumers, close that hole in your head, that bucket up there that they pushed in our heads. We won't take it anymore, and we will not have Indian Point. We're going to close it, and the money that we need will come from energy and the government cleaning up the waste material to make sure that their employees from White Plains and that whole area who are there to do what? Clean the mess up. That's one group. The next group will be young scientists, mostly young, but old folk, we're in the game too, if you're a scientist, finding how, how can we safely dispose of nuclear waste and remove nuclear from the planet itself. We opened up a madness when we did this. And the third group will be those workers, especially those union workers and administrators for these companies, local companies, and local workers, and local unions, will be in the business of building solar energy for the whole lower region of New York. That's good employment. They need it as union wages. They need all of the union benefits that come with that. So I say, Tom, to the question of energy, Gillibrand, close the pocketbook and let's come home. You've been there already, sister, far too long. <laughs> Coley Cock is on her way for six years' stay. Thank you. Full funding, and you have 90 days to come to compete. And, you know, you'll have money for your, your television ads, whatever it is. You'll have equal media time. Radio time and for 90 days prior to the primary. After the primary, the general election, you'll get public funding. Whoever wins the primary, you'll have equal media time right there. Public funding for 90 days prior to the general election. It's plain and simple. Well, figures. Well, he invited us onto his show. Uh, we haven't set the date yet. It's either going to be October 22nd or October 29th. And uh, at, scheduled right now, it's going to be Colia and me uh, doing the thing. He, wanted, um, he, he wants to do a show on the Green Party slate. So, um, you know, we are starting to take advantage of these things. Uh, hopefully, we can do it in, in all the boroughs. Hey, man, can you not I'm sorry? Pipeline through Puerto Rico. Um, the interesting thing is there is no storage facilities in Puerto Rico for the the gas. So this is like a, a gas pipeline to nowhere. But the song itself, the lyrics that I have, and it can apply to just about any of the environmental situations that we're facing. So uh, it's my uh, little blue-eyed salsa song. <laughs> <laughs> 